Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to be me for a second. I, um, I've been traveling around for the last three or four weeks. I'm in the middle of a global campaign. My heart is so open. And so I need to sit on the stage <laughs> just to feel a little bit more grounded. Um, and I haven't had a lot of sleep and you can hear the shake in my voice. It's, I'm full of emotion. I'm actually full of both sadness and joy at exactly the same time, which leave me equally vulnerable. It was my father's birthday um, during the week. He died very unexpectedly two and a half years ago. His name was Jerry, Big Jerry. He was six foot six and had size 15 feet and hands the size of shovels. He was the man who had always told me to be who I was. In this week, I've thought a lot about him and a lot about where I have come. It's very unusual for me to stand out and say, I am really proud of where I am today. I am really proud who I am growing into. And I think he would be really proud of me. I've spent so much of my life trying to be better, trying to be good enough so that I would be worthy of love, to be valuable, to fix problems so that I could be lovable. But somehow, in this wonderful menopausal 47, I feel better than I ever have. I'm at the two and a half year point of grief, excruciating, lonely grief. And though I had lost people before my father, nothing prepared me for the absence of him. But grief broke my heart open so hugely and it has allowed me to spurt and grow again. It's in my father's passing that I found the courage to do something I had always wanted to do, which was to launch a global campaign for disability inclusion. It was only as he was dying and he was saying, what are you waiting for? That I realized he was right. I had a career of tw nearly 20 years of disability business inclusion attached to this identity of inspirational blind girl. <laughs> I had got so tired and with it, I had been hiding, oddly, a whole load of personal parts of my life, just keeping up the front of being a change maker, a hero social entrepreneur, an innovator, when inside, actually, I was nearly internally crumbling. I had had a marriage that had imploded very, very dramatically, leaving me bank bankrupt and also very, very bruised. So when he turned to me and said, so what are you waiting for? What did I tell you? Be yourself and screw the bastards. I went, okay. Because I imagined what it would be like to die and not try. So let me get the whole blind inspirational story out of the way for a second here. I did a TED talk in 2010 and the story of how Caroline Casey got to here is very simply, I was born with ocular albinism, I am registered blind, I can't see you, hence I'm sitting down here to feel you better. My parents made a decision to bring me up as a sighted child and not tell me. And I found out by accident at 17 when my father gave me a driving lesson. Um, and you can laugh at that because it is ridiculous. Um, for those of you who are parents, why would you do that? Now the thing is, I didn't know, I didn't see, and I had had dreams to be Mowgli from the Jungle Book and a cowgirl and to race cars and motorbikes. That's why I wear the wings on my back. Anyway, that's the story. When I found out it, the doctor turned to my mother and said, why didn't you know? Why didn't I know that? And when I found out, Really like what Dina is saying, the identity of who I was, I didn't want that identity. And so I did my first act of conscious discrimination and I hid my identity about having a disability for 11 years. And I did it fabulously. 
I really need to tell you, beyond my hands, you are all blurry. I am significantly visually impaired, but I don't look it because they taught me how to look you in the eye, to feel your heart, and to decide on a person by how your gut feels. And I hit it so successfully right through business school. By the way, I started my career off as an archeologist, which is ridiculous for somebody who's visually impaired. <laughs> then I went to business school and then I went to Accenture and the manager of a consultancy firm employed a blind person and they never knew. I don't know what that says about that. But at 28 years old, I came out of the closet and finally said, I am me. Maya Angelou tells a story. There is no greater agony than an untold story inside you. So let me just explain to you, that is the blind inspirational girl story. Because when I came out of the closet, I went across India on an elephant, as one does, Bitkuban Mowgli from the Jungle Book, and suddenly I got a platform, a blind albino girl, you know, riding elephants. You can imagine what that might create. A story. So what I was obsessed by, though, is I had been introduced to the disability inequality crisis in the world, and I chose to use that platform to make amends for my own discrimination against my tribe. There are 1.3 billion people in the world who have a disability, but it will touch every single one of you. If I was to ask each of you to put your hand up if you plan to grow old, please do, I can't see you, but do it. Because if that's the case, you will touch disability. 90% of our children who have a disability don't get an education. You're 50% more likely to experience poverty, 50% more li less likely to get a job. We design more clothes for dogs than we do for people with disabilities. Disability exclusion costs our countries up to 7% of our GDP. So why is this huge scale of a problem? Have we never been able to fix it? Are we never felt the huge leadership behind other issues? And for me, Mary, I completely agree with education is a huge institution. But one institution or one ecosystem that has been very much part of the inequality crisis is business. If business does not see the value and worth of 1.3 billion people in the world as consumers and suppliers and talent and members of the community, there's no way we're ever going to fix this. No government or charity alone can. This is our issue. It's not about them or thee or us. This is ours. And so what I, after I got off that elephant, my job was to make business see our value. The story of the blind girl, this inspirational blind girl, has served to bring story and to get me platform, but I'm fed up of her. So as Dina was so honest, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm tired of just being the inspirational blonde Irish blind girl. I'm not her. I really am not do you know what? I've survived so much more in my life, so much more unspeakable trauma and abuse, but I choose not to make that my story. What I choose is surviving that and how I've survived it, to force and courage and let my heart open for the energy to position disability equally in our world. Not because I think disability is more important, but because I know what it's like not to belong. I know what it's like not to be seen, and I know what it's like not to be heard. If we could see that disability is only an impairment, and it's society that disables us just because we come out different, and we open our hearts to that, wouldn't that be bloody magnificent? Yes, it would. Because not one of us is defined by any tiny part of ourselves or several pieces of us. We grow and learn every day. We screw up and we, we thrive. And that's the excitement of where I am now. Goodbye, elephant girl. Hello, woman. Hello, woman. So I'm going to finish up. Thank you. I am going to, and I don't mind crying, but I'm going to finish up by saying the reason I'm so proud of myself is after his death, I did launch that global campaign. I wanted to create the uncomfortable truths, like Al Gore's inconvenient truths, and go out and find 500 Sheryl Sandbergs and Paul Pomans, the biggest CEOs in the world, to change this. No more excuses. No more we choose LGBTQ over gender, and we choose gender over race. That is insane to categorize inclusion, to pit humanity against each other. 
And I'm sorry for you CEOs that it's hard to lead right now, but there is an inclusion revolution coming on and you do have to be the leaders of that. And so I launched the Valuable 500 in Davos this year against all the odds when everybody told me I couldn't. And that is to get 500 leaders, CEOs around the world to commit to putting this on their leadership agenda with their head and their heart, with their head and their heart. And I'm going back to Davos in 2020 with 501 if it's the last thing I do. I want to end by saying a few things that I've learned and known is none of us are defined by this moment, this story, this stage, this role, this position, this failure, this marriage breakup, not at all. Because I'm here, I have never been in the best place in my life because somewhere in that audience is my husband who I am marrying on the 20th of July. Again, because we ran away and did it quietly after my dad died, so hey Gar. We are building, we've just finished building a home together after I lost everything I ever owned and only held a piece of cutlery. And I have found my voice, not as a girl, but as a woman. The second thing I want to say is, you can feel love and pain at the same time. They're the two wings. I think it's the juxtaposition between the yin and the yang is where that potent beauty comes from. The heart and the head, the head and the heart, the soft and the strong. My God, isn't it great? And very lastly, you see these sparkly wings on my back. I dare us, I dare us to dare them, all the leaders in their place, to use those hearts because the wings of transformation are about patience and struggle. They are, and that's okay. And to live and to be brave is to find failure all the time. That's okay. No judgment, and we find ourselves judging, just take that judgment back and be kind. And the wings may have a short expanse, but right between wings is a heart. And you know what? The beating of a heart is infinite. And if this sounds hippie, I'm sorry, but nothing, nothing is stronger than heart and love. It will beat it all. But we all have to use our hearts, every single one of us, and our voice, and our truth, because this is the time for a heart revolution. Thank you. People are standing up for you. Hmm.